All right. What's up, guys? Welcome back to Quick Sticks. Uh, this is episode four. I am back with James. Uh, Samwise, unfortunately, couldn't make it this week, but we've got a special guest this week. We got our boy Bryce on. How are we doing, Bryce? Good. How are you guys? All good. All good. good Happy to have you well, on, man. man. Thank you guys to have me on. I appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Love talking to us, man. Yeah. So go ahead and intro yourself real quick for us. Just uh, We know you're coaching, but give us some background, how you know James and everything. Yeah, absolutely. So James and I go back to college. We both played college lacrosse together at Wingate for a couple of years. Had a blast. Obviously, we're still close friends now. And, um, you know, obviously, I'm from Apex, North Carolina. Um, went and played football and lacrosse there uh, all four years. Came back. I'm now a teacher and now officially the varsity head coach at Apex High School. So hey, congrats, I've come full sir. circle. Yeah. Hey, congrats, yeah. man. That's awesome. Awesome, awesome, man. Well, we're happy to have you. Appreciate you being on. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So let's jump right in. We had first round of the playoffs this weekend. Um, some pretty dope games to watch. James and Sam and I were actually together watching them. Um, let's jump in. Redwoods Whip Snakes was the first game that we have. So obviously this game, same story, different year. Right, um, right. Redwoods were up early. Zed Williams completely took over, uh, brought them back, and then Matt Rambo wins the game. You know, Deja Vu, man. Yeah, right. Deja Vu, man. The same thing. That's yes. crazy. Go ahead, man. But so I cut Redwood some slack. They were without TD Erlen. They were without Perkovic. Um, Face off stats were awful. They only won a small margin of them. But who I was looking to step up in this game was Miles Jones. And he did not at all. He was 0 for 4 shooting, and it was zero points. Really, Jules Hennenberg was the only reason that Redwoods were even in this game. Um, he finished with six points, I think. But wow. you look at whip snake, Zed Williams had nine points. Um, <laughs> unfortunately for Zed and the whips, that was not the talk of the game. The talk no, that is still going on, and I would love to get y'all's opinion on, is there's a lot of talk that Zed was thumbing the ball the entire game. Um, seeing a ton of comments on their Instagram and Twitter posts about it. Between that and the officiating, people are not happy that whip snakes won. At all. What did you guys think? At all. So, as far as the thumbing thing, um, anybody who hasn't played the process to realize, like, it happens. Uh, a lot of players do it, especially attack men. But my rebuttal to anybody saying that is, like, it's very easy to see on the field, especially if we're doubling Zed as he's dodging. You can see that very obviously. And I never saw one defender look at the ref and say, thumbing, thumbing, chesting, whatever. So, sure, Ramo makes that goal. It's the same story. Whipstakes lose, now it's thumbing. Now, if they lost, would people talk about Zed thumbing the ball? I don't think they would. So, I don't think it happened. I don't think the refs had any favor. I think people are just mad that the whip snakes are doing what the whip snakes do. So what you got, Bryce? I agree. Uh, yeah, I mean, guys, these guys chirp at the refs all game long. Right. And like you said, like, if he was thumbing the ball, they would have mentioned it five million times. The refs would have been on it. Like, these guys, yep. just like the players, the refs are the best at what they do, like refereeing the game. They would have seen it. And I just – I don't buy the excuses and – Sure, it might have happened one or two times, but is that the reason why he went for nine points on the game? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Well, and that was the thing Thank is, you. like, it wasn't one or two possessions. People were saying he did it the entire game. And to your point, like, the goalie can see that. When you double, they can see that. The refs are looking for that. So, it's like the fact that that game went four quarters and no one said a thing is – Thank you. I have Thank a hard time you. The players it, chirp at the referees if, like, someone on the other team looks at them wrong. So I yep. just have a hard time believing. <laughs> Seriously. That Seriously. They Every, I mean, the PLL, like they have – away with thumbing the ball the whole time. Right. Rambo, Rambo will just be talking to the ref before he's – you know, before he gets on the field. Like, they're like buddies. They would easily be like, hey, Zed's thumbing, check your next play. They never right, did. Yeah. So I don't think it happened. Yeah. Um, my last note on this is last week my prediction was that Whip Snakes would win this game by one. So I'm just saying. It's pretty <laughs> Um, I mean, at this point, can we say Rambo's going to have the game winner like every year? Yeah. <laughs> every week. <laughs> yeah, every week. Wow. Apple's going to get burned game. and Rambo's going right. to score. Right. Next game right. we got is Archer's Chaos. James, I'll flip it to you or Bryce. So I'm going to start with, with, with Bryce's take on this. I think it's going to be interesting having Bryce and I's banter. I'm a Chaos fan. He's an Archer's fan. So, Bryce, I want to get your take on the game one. And then, two, what, what do the Archers do? To, to kind of make this jump, right? We've seen this crazy roster that has produced nothing so far. So what do they need to do in the offseason and what happened against the chaos? Go ahead. Yeah, game one, I mean, guys, tell me this game didn't feel like it was Albany versus UNC. Like, if, the, if they were – if we were to put them in college uniforms, 
This yep. game is Albany versus UNC, just the play styles. Like, that's all I could think about watching this game. Yep. Uh, um, awesome game to watch. I agree with you, though. Like, the Archers, to me, are like the Saints in the NFL. Like, they get so far in the regular season. They break all these records. They look so good. They are the talk of the town in the regular season. Then they get to the playoffs, and they just dud. They, right. Their off-ball defense in this game was horrendous. Horrible. It was horrible. Uh, Thank horrendous. you. Thank you. Horrendous. Yes. Their off-ball defense was terrible. So yeah. just knowing the way that um, – chaos or if you want to call them albany plays yep. Yep. you know off ball is like their main thing and, and just there was so i watched the highlights again just to remind myself how often guys were running free right at gittleman and he just he had no chance right as right. far as what the archers need to do again it's like if you look at the saints roster it's just like how do you it's like bama playing anyone in the sec there might be some there might be a georgia there might be a texas a&m that might get close but no one's able to bridge that gap here. And I right. feel like the archers are the same way. It's just like they have an amazing roster, but they arguably don't have a guy down on defense. And some could argue Stephen Kelly could use, they could improve at the dot, which I think they could, but I think Gittleman serviceable. I think Stephen Kelly is serviceable. To me, the biggest thing is they need a number one defenseman down there. That's what they need. They, and it's not just what his uh, number one defenseman brings. It's the communication and holding each other responsible because, like I said, that off-ball defense was terrible, and that was the reason why they lost the game. Right. So when you're talking about a defender, they need an Eddie Klaesner. They need a, they need mm -hmm. a Tucker Durkin, right? A guy who's going right. to be inside and say, a hold, voice. slide. Right. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, McMahon is good, but, like, McMahon's not a shutdown guy. And that's what no. I think the archers are missing. Like, you have lots of firepower all over the field, right? But if you – defense win championships at the end of the day. And I think the archers prove that once again. You can right. – in, in, in the PLL with the shot clock and everything – you just you got to be able to get stops, and that's what the archers weren't able to do. And Blaze had a classic Blaze game where he's just saving on anything. Everything. The sun. Everything, anything man. The sun. Everything. So, wow, wow, Blaze but, sending, Blaze saving everything underneath the sun. That's a headline. Yeah, wow. that's uh, that's just, a headline. That's fire. It's the truth. That's fire. It's the yeah. truth. Yeah. yeah. So. Um. So my take on on the game. Um. A lot of people call me crazy for having the chaos win, even though I personally thought they hit their offensive stride the last two weeks. But I think the difference has been they've hit their defensive stride. And it's not just Blades. They're rotating well. Their offense looks strong. I mean, Rowlett is now shutting people down. Everyone keeps wondering, what happened to Grant Amen last year in this game? It's always the same game. Grant Amen doesn't play well. It's against the chaos. Jack Rowlett is too aggressive, too fast for Grant Amen, which sounds crazy. But look at Amen's games against them. I think as of right now, he's his kryptonite. Um, I had Dane Smith as my kind of MVP of the game. And something that Bryce talked about was that off-ball defense. There was time where Dane Smith would just walk towards a defender and just wait for the defender to come to him. He wouldn't dodge. He's just going, waiting, and then he would double the Chase Frazier. That's how these guys play, man. I mean, it's yeah. indoor. It's mini sticks. It's easy stuff. So I think you're like 100% right with the defender and what they need. I am a little skeptical, though, about Stephen Kelly. I'm surprised that you said that they don't really need a change there because, honestly, I think they do. I'm not saying Kelly's bad, but he's not enough. Um, yeah, with the talent, you know what I mean? obviously, just with the talent that every other roster has at the dot, I agree right, he's, right. he's lesser, um, but he's, yeah, I agree. It's serviceable. Yeah. Like you said, it, it comes down to every single possession at this point. That's true, especially these late games. So that was my take on that. I mean, chaos won. Archers have a, have a lot to deal with this offseason. I mean, a lot is in, like, they don't really need to change much. They just need to execute. Mm -hmm. It's a, lot, it's a lot more just execution, and I, and I think they're getting that whole, like, oh, is this going to happen again syndrome? And then they started to get cold, a lot of turnovers late in the game. So we'll see. But Chaos took it, and uh, they move on. So I'm happy, and Bryce, I, I'm, I'm sorry your season's over, but the uh, semifinal, <laughs> yeah. semifinal should be good. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Matt. Uh, yeah, I mean, you guys pretty much said it all. James, you called Blaze having a career game last week. Certainly did. Um, Archers are an offense with that roster that can easily put up 15 on your head. So holding that that mm -hmm. offense to 10 goals is a victory in itself. But that's true. That's true. I mean, it came down to possessions. Like chaos won on majority of faceoffs, and then when the Archers did get the ball, they shot like 22 percent or something. It was yep. like, and then the flip side, like you guys were saying, so many times when the chaos scored, they would do the replay, and the even the commentators were like, "What are the Archers doing? 
like they two. Their defense no looked three. lost. Yeah, yes. really. So they looked like, they looked they look you, lost. You, you got yeah. you had a defender standing in front of the goalie, right in front of the crease, just guarding no one, and it's like right. You can't do that in the playoffs. You're going to lose no matter who you're Now, playing. I kind of want to give them an out because the Chaos are such a weird offense. Like, nobody backs up to dodge. Like, yeah. it's literally like it sweeps, and then it's like, I'm going to come pick for you, then I'll slip. They have a play where they send a double pick to the backside, and the top guy slips to the net, and the outside guy curls up over top. And that's mm – -hmm. I mean, that's tough to guard. So, people are going to look lost when you run it like that, but Andy Towers has a system going, man. It's a dangerous team. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll yeah. see. Oh. Yeah. We got chaos moving on. Um, third game we had was Atlas Cannons. Would y'all yeah, like in this one? I got that one. 13-9 um, final. Uh, the Atlas took this. The Atlas had great goalie play the entire game. I thought that somewhere where they were going to fall short. I'm not a big Cannon guy, but he played really well. Um, Lyle went 3-1. and one. However, I think Michael Rexrod, who maybe, uh, Bryce, you might not know this, but uh, Michael's actually a Loudoun County kid. Um, oh, okay. And I, I coached with him for a summer, and he has been Lyle Thompson's almost kryptonite. He held him to zero goals this year, and I know three and one sounds crazy to say he shut him down, but Lyle wasn't really involved in the offense. I mean, he wasn't getting top side. He wasn't doing, like, all the things he normally does. So I think that was a big part of the game, but, you know, Bryce is a face-off guy, so he'll understand this. Trevor won 72% of his face-offs. Dude, that's insane. Dude, bro, you're not winning the game. You're not. It doesn't matter. You're not. No, you're no. not winning the game. It does like no. X's, O's, all that stuff does not matter. Um, the Atlas show they really have offensive power, and I'm. I mean, four or five guys that can really put three on your head. Um, Jeff T is as good as advertised. I don't know as it stands of an attackman of his size being able to score in the different ways that he does. I mean, I've seen near side pipe shots. I've seen question marks. I mean, he doesn't. He doesn't miss inside. I mean, Jeff T is just the truth. So. I have Atlas actually winning the championship, so I wasn't surprised that they took this win. But um, it kind of sucks to say that, like, the Cannons with that awesome roster with Lyle and uh, Paul Rabel, who I know Bryce loves, um, wasn't, able to, wasn't able to really put it together. <laughs> so, Atlas win, Cannon season's over. But, uh, it, you know, it was, it was a good game. I'm very, very curious, Bryce, to take on this. I, I, you know, the game, I could second everything you said. Um, I never really thought the Cannons had a really high chance at winning this game just because of the massive advantage at the dot, really, all right. game long. Mm -hmm. um, but I just want to take a second to say Ben Rubior and just the new roster that he brought to the Atlas, yeah. we got to give this guy some credit. I mean, yeah, the absolutely. Atlas were a completely different team last year, and yeah. they revamped their entire roster. Rubio had a really good sense of what he wanted to make this team and give them an identity. Because last year, you could argue that they didn't have one, even though they had a lot of different pieces to work with. But this is a team that is a true team. And I yep. cannot just give – I just have to give that coaching staff a ton of credit because – they had a vision. They made some hard cuts, including debatably the best lacrosse player of all time in Paul Rabel, and just getting rid of some really qualified people, Pinnell as well. And they had a vision. They stuck to it. And they have a really good team. And, James, I like your pick of the Atlas going to the championship game. Whether or not they make it there, I don't know. But I really give that whole coaching staff credit because this is a completely different-looking team than last year. Yeah, I agree. And I, and I think – for our viewers who watch a lot of basketball, think that Monty Williams, right, of the Suns, they had to revamp that whole team, but they did things in the draft that people didn't understand. They get a shooter, a 6'9 guard at a UNC. Everyone calls them crazy, and then they end up in the finals because they needed a 6'9 shooting guard. They didn't need whatever was there, and they had to cut people who were good. So a lot of credit to that coach you said because Atlas aren't just a quality team. They are a team top to bottom. Good defender inside, solid faceoff guy. Romar Dennis can dodge, Jeff T can finish. Even, I mean, even Caraway, the other side of Tackman. I mean, he has he's had a hell of a season. He can't take a shorty on now. So they put it together, and that's why I have the, I have them winning. You know, no questions asked. So that, that was a good shout out to the coach, Matt. What you got? Yeah, I mean, that's a good point that Bryce brought up. I think if you don't think coaching is important in the PLO or just in lacrosse, I right. don't know what you were watching, but watching right. the Atlas game because, <laughs> I mean, yeah, dude, they were irrelevant last year, and. I would say at this point, they've got to be the favorite besides Water Dogs to win it all. So, right, right. But, I mean, the MVP of this game was Atlas's defense. They To hold any team to zero goals in the fourth quarter, let alone a team that has Lyle Thompson and Paul Rabel in it, um, to zero goals is, is pretty impressive. But, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, Eric Law and Teat on offense were just untouchable. Disgusting, so, man. Yeah, I mean. Disgusting. In this game, it was either Chrome or Cannons playing Atlas. Chrome would have lost by 15. 
Definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Definitely. You know, can seriously. we take a I'll second to just credit. admit how bad the Chrome are? Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> that, whoa. That's a big Chrome guy. Whoa, that's a big Chrome guy. Do that. We, need, we should take that offline. We'll take that offline. <laughs> if, you, um, if you listen to episodes one through three, we've bashed on the Chrome pretty bad. We, we bashed pretty hard on it. But, Bryce, I, I will have to say, though, remember, they have been injury ridden, you know, yes. especially yeah. this year. Yeah. Listen. You know, we talk about whip snakes without Rambo. We have talked about them without Jordan Wolf. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. You know, so so I agree. They're bad. You know, they're definitely bad. And have a lot I'm, to. I'm looking for the Chrome to make an Atlas type of move next season. I want them yeah. number two seed. Let's get it Revamp. going. Revamp. Revamp. I like that. Tim Sudan. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. All right. Uh, very quickly, let's do our best play from the weekend. James, you want to kick us off? Sure. Easy, easy pickings. Um, Romar Dennis has an absolute disgusting jump shot in this game that just takes a seat in top left laser I mean, and Bryce and I were talking about uh kind of before we hopped on but the, the goalie completely like he was he mistimed the shot and he was behind like he went to punch after the goal and he hit the net like that's how fast it was going I mean he had to be going at least 100 um so that was my highlight of the weekend Robert Dennis's shot has always been fast but hasn't always been on cage and it was today so good job Bryce what you got uh, mine is Grant Amen's goal when he's basically at two and two, and then he beats Blaze Reardon, debatably the best goalie in the PLL, near side. Near side. For a goal. Yeah. Yeah. And like, obviously, yes, he had a shorty on him, but still, I think it just proves like how dynamic of a player Grant is to be able to be at two and two and still get open, get back to your right hand, and just put the ball in the back of the net. I just, the guy is unbelievable and has changed direction. Right. Changed Explain what two and two is. Explain what two so, and two is. So normally on the island, you're five yards out and five yards up, right? And then two and two is basically that same thing, but you're two yards up and two yards out. And in the replay, it looked like Grant Amen was two feet up and two feet out, yep. and he was still able to put it in the back of the net. And to right. be able to do that in space is like basically saying that – CP3 can put a, the ball in the hoop with, I don't know, uh, anyone, anyone over seven foot guarding him at that point. Yeah, well, right. Just something. like his ability to twist and turn his body in such a small amount of space and still get a goal out of it without ending up in the crease, it, it just, he's unbelievable. How did he get his stick back in his right hand? There's no I, room. I don't know. It was I don't care if he was shorty or a pull. There, there is no room because he pulled it, but then he wound up. He still yeah. had room to yeah. want, dude. When I watched that, I was like, "Dog, this dude's crazy." Yeah, that, what I he mean, can that do was, in was such insane. a small space is unbelievable. Right, it's, it's, it's I was crazy. gonna, I was gonna pick that play too, not only for what he did, but how natural it looked. Like, it right, looked so right. easy. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah. I'm got, going man? with Paul Rabel's two pointer. Um, I mean, it was scoring a two pointer is a hell of a shot anyway, but it was a bounce shot, and just the timing of that goal. They were down by three in the third quarter. Mm-hmm. that made it a one goal game they absolutely I mean they were begging for a one point at that game yep. at that point so just the timing of that goal that's so impressive to do from that far out but yeah. also with how good the Atlas goalie was playing it was just like right so and to have a better year this year and he showed up when the cannons needed him so I got absolutely him. absolutely yeah. absolutely he showed and up when they needed him to hit a high bouncer from 15 out I mean that's what, what is saying. he had to throw to the ground seven ten yards out he did I mean, yeah it bounced 10, like you yards can't, in front of you the can't net. throw it five yards. That's over the cage, like yeah. easily. So it has to be like a seven, ten yard shot. So the time, that's crazy. That's and we crazy. were talking like I think the goalie thought it was going over the cage. That's why he right. like, kind of. That's why he punched last minute. Yep. Yeah. Because it was right. like, is this really going to go? Yep, it's going to go. In. So <laughs> it was, that was, it was, that was good. Weekend, though. That was good. Um, all right, so let's look towards next weekend. Let's do some predictions here. We've got our sure. final four set up. Um, first game we've got Atlas Chaos. Bryce, who you like in this one? This is tough, boys. I'm not gonna lie to you. So tough. I, my my brain says chaos. My yep. gut says Atlas. Yep. I'm gonna stick with Atlas, though. I think yep. they squeak out a one or two goal game here, just because, like I was hyping them up. I really think they are just a really good team, and for the chaos to come out and win this past game, I think this next game could be an easy uh, game that they may not show up for as right. highly as they did in this previous game. So it could be a letdown game. I'm not saying, but I'm just saying. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I, I get that because there was like – I mean, there was like the 13%, right? Only 13% of people think we can win. There's all this hype around the Archers game, but there isn't the same hype around this Atlas game. Exactly. Um, I have the exact same take. Like, I'm a chaos guy, so I want to say they can do it. But the Atlas are too good. I think Atlas win by one. 
Um, I think Blaze still stands on his head, but I think, you know, they're, they're going to give up too much. The only way Chaos have a chance is if Chris Cloutier is able to play. Because mm-hmm. people forget that he's out right now. So if he's, able to, if he's able to play and Chase Frazier's playing the way he is, I mean, I think they can do it. But uh, without that, I think Alex won by one. Matt, what you got? Damn. See, now I'm, like, second-guessing myself. Yeah, right? <laughs> well, because I'm, like, I'm like the clock – not that the Chaos are a Cinderella team by any means, but I'm, like, the clock has to strike midnight here at some point. But sure. I've said that for the last two damn weeks. That's so. what I'm saying. If it keeps going, Blaze can't do it again. They can't I bet, do it again. I've bet too many times against Chaos. I'm, I'm all aboard the Chaos train. Okay. I'm going Chaos. I think they're going to wow. slow the Alice offense down. I think wow. Blaze stays red hot. I'm taking Chaos 13-11. Okay. I like, I like that. Just, just for anybody to listen to, I, I have a little bet going with our other with our other host, Sam. We got some oh, money on the right. line for that game. So, uh, definitely going to be tuning in. What's our next one? All right, next game. And the other, only other game is Whipsnakes Water Dogs. Uh, I am beyond pumped for this game. I think, I think the winner of this game is your champion. Sure. Maybe sure. Atlas, but I, I think whoever wins this game is, is the superior team. Yeah. Um, I'm going Water Dogs. I think they've got <sighs> the superior defense. Um, offense faceoffs, goaltending, it's pretty even across the board. I just like mm-hmm. Liam Burns more than I like any defender on the Whipsnakes. Sure. But. I, I, I mean, this is going to be a one-goal game, in my opinion. I'm taking Water Dogs. It wouldn't surprise me if Whip Snakes win, but yeah. I'm taking Water Dogs 15-14. 15-14. That sounds, that sounds like. right. Oh, man. Um, this whole season, I've wanted to doubt the Water Dogs, man. I mean, I've gone back and watched some of their games three times just to be like, I just don't get it. How do they win? They always put it together. I got to have Whip Snakes. I think with Rambo and Gutty on the field at the same time, they are a completely different team than people are realizing. I mean, you are then rotating to Zed, to Rambo, or to Gutterding, which people need to remember, the highest score in Duke history. So, like, <laughs> I mean, we're talking and, about, like – And if you, watch, if you watch the game this past weekend, I mean, they're at the point where they're putting – I heard you say this before we got on. They're putting short sticks on these guys, and it's yep. like – I mean, you don't have a choice, but you don't. Like, you really don't. <laughs> you can't expect to stop them with that. No, and it, it makes all the rotations off. So I have whip snakes by one. Um, I don't want. I don't mean to give anybody deja vu, but I think Matt Rambo will have the goal at the end of the game oh, to, 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 <laughs> I, to push them push them over the top. Bryce, what you got? Um, I don't know. You know, I hope the water dogs follow the boys that pardon my takes advice and just shoot the shit out of the ball. Just yep. all long. Just love that shooting, 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 shooting. Um, and that's that's kind of where I see this game going. Honestly, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say the Whip Snakes just because some prove to me someone can beat them in the playoffs. I, I want to see True. it. Right we now, have, we, we have no it. facts on that. I, yeah. I want if there's a team to do it, I think it might be the Water Dogs. But until that happens, I just have to side. My I would place my money on the Whip Snakes. I'm going 1917 Whips. Ooh, dude, getting close dude, to my hot take be, of 20 yeah, goals. Uh, that's right. I was gonna say Matt. Matt has a take about 20 goals in the game. We, says, we says, haven't says, had it before. Ha- haven't had it. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. Right. So one thing I think people need to realize is Kyle Burnlore is really hitting a stride right now for the Whip Snakes. He's playing. He's playing really well. So now we gotta go to the next section. So go ahead. All right. So last section we got is wall ball, which again is our one hundred and one session where we kind of review basic stuff. If you're just getting into lacrosse or just getting into PLL, uh, I'm gonna flip it over to James. I know you got some questions for our our high school coach here, so I'll flip it to you. I do. Um, for anybody who's becoming a lacrosse fan, we're still changing a lot of the rules, trying to make the game faster. Faceoff has changed a lot. The shot clock's been implemented. But Bryce here is actually a high school coach right now, Apex, North Carolina. So my question to you, Bryce, is what have these rule changes done to your season? And how do you prepare players who are going on to the next level that might actually be going on to something that has different rules, right? Like your faceoff guy right now might be able to go down on a knee. He can't do that next fall. Right. So that might change everything he's doing. So, my, you know, very, very overarching broad question, but what has it changed as far as what you're coaching and what you're teaching kids with all these rule changes? I, I think it's you just see the evolution of the game, really. It does change a lot. Um, you know, the uh, coach that I'm taking up after went to Rutgers, and he's very much an old school guy. And just throughout each, we've we've always been an old school type team, you know, just bring the lumber kind of team, very basic fundamental kind of guys. And and we we play the system well, but I think you're starting to see the evolution where it's more basketball oriented. It's more time and space. And you have to teach these guys that if you have time and you have room and you're in a good position to shoot, you need to shoot because more often than not, the numbers are in your favor that that ball is going to go in the back of the net. 
Right. So, you know, kind of going off the face-off point, that was, that's a huge transition. I mean, that just changed that entire position. And, right. you know, we're still waiting on the official rule change. The word on the street is that uh, they will ban going down on a knee, but right now it is still legal here in North Carolina. Can so they do motorcycle speedway. grip at high school? No, it is, it is neutral. It is neutral. Um, well, actually, okay. you can still go motorcycle um, okay. and down on a knee. But like I said, yeah. the word on the street is that, you know, everyone's been kind of preparing to get rid of that rule. So everyone's yep. been kind of getting more to the stand up and S SNG in general. So yep. I think everyone's ready for that. As far as the shot clock thing goes and just the evolution of the game, the main thing for me is I just want some, some type of similarity from each level of the game. We see, the, we see the way the PLL plays. We understand the way college is played. And we can see the way high school is played. And I just want to get to where college football and college basketball are. There's some minute differences between each different level. But with lacrosse, there's some pretty big changes, big including the field and how big the field is at this point and different things right. like that. Okay. And so I think that's a big big difference here and it does change the way we play the game and the change the way we coach the game right. so i think just for our sake for people who are involved in the sport it's keeping up with the joneses really yeah. but my concern is how do we continue to grow the game if we continue to make these changes for someone who doesn't know the game but wants to learn the game yeah. and there's so many changes throughout each level i think that makes it a little bit more complicated especially with the arrival of sixes in that format debatably going into the Olympics. Right. So we'll see. It definitely, we, the evolution of the game is really good, but we need some commonalities between each level of the sport in order to continue to grow this game where right. we want it to go. So that, that kind of gives me to another question. And for any of our viewers and listeners, Bryce is going to be modest, but Bryce was the best face-off guy I played with <laughs> and or against when I was at Wingate. He was dominant. Um, I actually got to play on the wing a couple times with him. My question to you is, how different would you play face-offs if you were in the PLL with that 10 yards taken out of the middle? Because you were a pinch and pop guy a little bit, but you also mm -hmm. played to space a lot. Mm -hmm. So right. what would that mean for you? Because you only have, what, a six, seven-yard gap there before a pole could probably reach, you know, right there? Because TD, you know, he's doing two yards, two yards, three yards, something short. So what would you have changed going from college to the PLL as far as how you face off with the, with the shortened field? I think it's the same way as the way they're playing right now. If you watch and, and you, you actually focus on it, a lot of these guys, it's, if it's a ground ball battle, it's because the wings have already crashed in. What the faceoff guys are trying to do is they're trying to just get it into the back of their stick so they can control the ball as quickly as possible. You right. have, in the PLL, you maybe have one to two steps before the wings are crashing in on you. Yeah. So I think the biggest difference is the timing. You have to go in and out like that. Otherwise, yeah. It, turn, it goes from a one-on-one -on -one ground ball battle to a 3v3 ground ball battle, and that just makes it more complicated. And that, right. obviously, you know, you bring poles into the mix, and it just gets even more hairier of a situation, yep. especially as a face-off guy with a stick that looks like this. Happening. Right. Yeah, I mean, watching, <laughs> watching Trevor throw sometimes, I get nervous, but – I know he has that. He has that thing down. Okay, so it's we only have a couple. speed, I would say, and just right. getting it out in one or two steps and then just finding green grass so you're not just getting beat on with a pole. Yeah, so we only have a couple minutes left, but I, but I do want to ask you about the two-point arc and shot clock. Um, I, th I think we'll, we'll just stick to the two-point arc for now. I was having a conversation with somebody on Instagram, and he does not want the two-point arc uh, uh, in college or in high school. Um, he had a very interesting points on it. He said it would ruin kind of like the end of games and what have you. So do you see a two point arc coming to high school anytime soon? And are you a proponent of it? Do you, do you think a two point arc would, would move the sport forward or would it put us at a, at a place where kids are just trying to be Steph Curry? Listen, if they move the two point arc in, just like kind of how they do in college and pro basketball, the three point arc is at different lengths. Yep. I would be a game for it. I'm a proponent for change, uh, not changing the game, mm -hmm. but evolving the game. I, I think right. there's some different scenarios, especially on such a large field, what you play on when high school, it would help, but it would, there's no one in high school who's consistently shooting and scoring from 15 yards out. There's just, do you there's think, just what do you think? What do you think it would be at 12? I would say 12. Yeah. If I was going to propose anything, I would say a 12 yard arc would okay. be really cool. Um, okay. I, I still like the restraining box, but the PLL shows that you don't need a restraining box in order At all. to cross. And that's, At all. I like the different um, schemes that PLL teams are coming up with because it just shows you that the sport is more like basketball than it is anything else. Cause 
doesn't matter what the shape or the look of of the court or the field. It's still you're trying to put the ball in the back of the still net. Still basketball, it's just how no matter you're able what. To do that. Yeah, right? that's true. And again, that's it's true. more on spacing and time and room now than it ever was before. It's not rotations. It's not forms. It's right. just it's more basketball esque than it ever has been before. Yeah, and, and it's going to be interesting to see as kids get better and are able to shoot further and further out. Like, what is a bad shot, right? Like right. Dame Dame Lillard step back against Paul George in the playoffs ten years ago. That's a horrible shot. Mm-hmm. Now that's in routine. What are we going to do when kids are pulling from 15, 16? What does that rotation look like? You're going to have your D guy going from the crease I mean, to 15 gonna, out? You're going to start having high school players yell Perkovic and just launch it. <laughs> <Perkovic>! <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it's really exciting. Like, even just to have a conversation with, with you guys about even a two-point arc, you know, to think that Bryce and I started playing lacrosse you know, even not that long ago, and that sounded like, you know, so far-fetched. And now mm-hmm. it's something that might, you know, that might be it. So, I mean that, that was definitely great. I mean, I don't know if you had any if you had any questions for for Bryce as far as rules and whatnot, but that's, that, no, that's I, I mean that covered it. I'm I'm definitely glad to hear your proponent of it because I think you know we're seeing sports that have obviously been around or big longer like basketball and football still adjust rules to make high school and college more like the pros. Whether True. it's lower adding a shot clock, lowering the shot clock in basketball. So right. Um. I, I mean. I don't I don't know the state by state case of if they're going to add things like the two point arc, but I can certainly see why coaches would want it. I mean, it's it's just helping prepare kids for. I think we need to shorten the reset. I think that's what needs to happen for the PLL next year. Like it needs to go down to 45. The last thing as a high school coach is obviously we're trying to grow the game. So a large majority of my players come from other sports teams. And it's really getting them on the lacrosse field is really based on relating it to the other sports that they're able to play. So I think it's really important that as coaches, we're able to say what you do on the basketball court is what you're going to do on the lacrosse field. Like those same proponents of understanding time, space, picks, what not. Picks, hedging, all that, all the same. You can do that here on the lacrosse field. It's the same proponent. So as growing the game, as much as we're trying to, I think it's important that we continue to bring in and tie these other sports to the lacrosse field. Absolutely. Absolutely. That was was, was great, Bryce. Great wall ball session for anybody who's kind of learned the sport. So Matt, go ahead. Yeah, well, that's all we got this uh, this week, guys. But uh, thanks again for everyone tuning in. Special thanks to our guest, Bryce. Hope you had fun, man. Absolutely. Uh, we we'll definitely have you on again, man. We'll definitely have you on again, man. This is great. Yeah. This is great. Well, this is awesome. uh, yeah, so we will, uh, we'll see you guys next week. Cool. That sounds good.